The driving force of genetic science today is disease prevention. This means looking at the genes you have and determining what they will do to you over the course of your life. Empowering you to make decisions that can affect your chances of survival. But the ultimate in preventative medicine is to avoid damaging genes being in your body in the first place. And the only way to do that is to intercept them before you are born. Introduce you to the nice folks we've got in here today. Gwen, I'm going to start with this leg that I'm touching. Gwen Berkowitz is having fertility treatment, but not because she is infertile. She and her husband Jeff are using a groundbreaking new procedure called pre implantation genetic diagnosis. Their hope is that PGD will give them a child able to survive more than a few weeks. For Jeff and Gwen, there was no warning that either of them carried any kind of genetic disorder until it claimed the life of their first child two years ago. They have come to the sea to perform a simple ceremony to commemorate the passing of their daughter, Logan Page. Logan was born with a congenital disorder called mitonic dystrophy. I didn't hear a cry. I heard like one little whimper and that was it. And, but they brought her over to me. Like a few minutes later, they put her on my chest just for a second. I just, you know, I was like, this is amazing. This is my baby. And I, it was like I was unaware of the tubes and the, the vent. I just felt like, this is my baby. I'm going to get to take her home in a couple of days. Before they took her to the Neal Day intensive care unit, they brought me over and they let me. They were because they worked. They're like, there's a problem because she cannot. She can't breathe on her own. Logan never did breathe unaided. She survived just five weeks. Logan's genes were inherited from both her parents, but the mitonic dystrophy gene was inherited from Gwen. The affected gene is responsible for muscle control and it goes wrong like this. As well as the normal arrangement of base letters, it has an unusual addition. A series of regular repeats. C T G. C T G. C T G. Everyone has a certain number of these triplet three nucleotide repeats. Jeff happens to have seven of them on one of his chromosomes and on his other chromosome he has 16. And that's totally normal. Over on Gwen's side, though, she has 225 of these CGG triplets. That's too many. And that gives her some symptoms of myotonic dystrophy. Like opening jars is when I noticed it. I can show you now with my hand. If I tighten it really tight for like four seconds, five seconds, and then try to open it, that's as fast as I can open it. So. When Gwen's 225 repeat bases were passed on to Logan, a further mutation occurred and she inherited 1,500. The lack of muscle control in Logan's body was so severe, it was fatal. For Gwen and Jeff, there is a 50-50 chance that any future child will inherit Gwen's faulty gene. These are not good odds and having had an affected child raises the chances of having another. It's a lottery and, and you, are, you are basically taking a chance and you don't know how the dice are going to fall, you don't know how the cards are going to play out and so you have to cheat. This means using pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. In simple terms, it allows Dr. Hughes to cheat at the game of genetic cards. If every hand is an embryo, before they commit to playing that hand, Hughes can analyze it to see if it has the mutated gene. Only when he is sure it's clear will he allow the Berkowitz to play it. Gwen and Jeff have decided that their only chance of a healthy child is to use PGD. 
17 of Gwen's eggs have been removed. A single sperm is injected into each egg and they are left to grow. After three days, 11 eggs have successfully developed into embryos. Each is a collection of eight cells, but enough that one can be spared. The cell they remove will be sent away to be tested for the mitonic dystrophy gene. The next day, all the biopsies arrive in Detroit at the genetics testing center run by Dr. Hughes. To find out which embryos are affected, they count the number of repeat bases they've inherited from their parents. After eight hours of tests and analysis, Dr. Hughes has the results Gwen and Jeff have been waiting a week to receive. Hello? Mr. Berkowitz. Yes. Mark Hughes calling from Michigan. Hi, Dr. Hughes. Hi. Hi Dr. Hughes, it's Gwen. Hi, Gwen. Well, we just got the data and we have some wonderful news. We have results on 10 of the 11 samples. Five of them are predicted uh, not to have myotonic dystrophy. The next day, Gwen and Jeff are called into the clinic for the final stage of the process, re-implanting the healthy eggs. Of the five clear of mitonic dystrophy, they will implant two. The other three will be frozen in case the transfer doesn't succeed. The five embryos which tested positive will be discarded. It seems the only logical thing to do because they certainly have mitonic dystrophy. Yet it still raises an ethical problem with many people. That's wrong, that's murder. It's like if they had the disease and maybe that's how God wanted to be. To me that raises all sorts of ethical problems. So if you have a baby that um, you know years from now it's going to have a problem, but does that mean you abandon the baby or abort the baby or you know what, what do you do to, you know, it's just kind of human beings playing God. All we're doing is helping them start their pregnancy with a healthy child. I don't really think it plows new ethical grounds, but I'll tell you what, everybody walking down on the street has a visceral, internal, basic attitude about reproduction and when you mix reproduction into the pot with genetics everybody has an opinion. In our poll there was disagreement about whether parents should have the right to screen out embryos with hereditary diseases. Americans were the least keen with only two in five people in favor while twice as many Turks believe that they should. In a society where we're all completely focused on the idea that there are standards and norms that can be engineered in advance for our children, how tolerant are we likely to be to that child who doesn't accommodate the norm, who has a disability or a handicap? I have a, a daughter who has some extra material on one of her chromosomes, uh, some abnormality. And um, frankly, I'm, I'm just, I'm thrilled with who she is. You know, she's not like you or me. You know, her, she has uh, delays in learning and so forth. But um, that's how God made her and that's who she is. Gwen and Jeff have had letters objecting to their decision to screen out damaged embryos. So, you know, some of the letters that we got, not quite comparing us to Nazis, or but alluding to it. Um, we don't want a baby with blonde hair and blue eyes, or, you know, a girl specifically, or a boy specifically. All we want is a healthy baby, and that's it. That's all we're asking for. Now, from the point of view of the health and happiness of the family and the child, I think that's a wonderful development. Um, I can't see how anybody with any spark of human kindness can complain about it. You don't have a right in this world to have a baby, all right? It's not, a, it's not something that... If, there are many people that can't have babies. There are people who have infertility. There are people that, for some reason or another, can't have their own babies. They can adopt. In our poll, the majority of people would consider never having children if they risked passing on a serious hereditary disease. In the UK, more than four out of five would consider remaining childless. More and more people are using genetic screening to avoid passing on potentially deadly genes to their children. And this looks set to increase as the technology improves. But for some people, just screening for a condition is not enough. They need more than avoidance. They need a cure. The Nash family have pushed the technology of genetic screening